Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Welcome to Yeshua Wellsprings Outreach Bible Study. We are grateful that you are able to come today to study the Word of God and so that we can grow together. Amen. We are in the midst of this series of Build a House and a part of, and a step part of how we build a house is one of the things is we study. Last couple of weeks we've been talking about study. We talked about the benefit, why we study, but then we talked. Then last week we talked about how we study as a father and son. The main thing that we do is listen. There's a lot of people we talked about last week, beginning how a lot of people, when they study the Word of God, we they just read and they speak. And they fail to listen, sit and listen to what the words are being said and what the Spirit of God is teaching them. This week, we are going to discuss about marriage. How marriage is the same, how we study the Word of God, how we, it's the same way how we should be studying each other, those who are married, a husband and wife, a man and a woman should be studying each other. And it doesn't matter whether you're married or in the courting stage or going out. You still are studying each other. So before we get into the message, let's go ahead and join together in a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you together today for allowing us to come to you, to seek your will. Lord, open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our heart to your word. Teach us what you want us to know. Help us grow together and strengthen us with your word. And let your spirit teach us today. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So like I said, we're going to be talking a little bit more about studying today. we got this week, and I do believe next week will be the last piece that we're going to talk about studying. Next week we'll get into about uh, spiritual warfare and apologetics. Okay, But this week we're going to talk about relationship marriage. How... When we, how a husband and wife, a man and a woman, whether they're married or dating, even in the dating stage, there's times where you are studying each other, you're learning about each other, is the same concept of how we should be with the Word of God, with God, with Jesus Christ. For He is our bridegroom, because we are the bridegroom body of the church is the bride of Christ. You can read that in the word of God. You can go to Revelations chapter 19. You talk about the bride. Okay. You go, you go, there's thousands of scriptures I do believe that talk about the relationship factor of being one with Christ. All right. But first and foremost, let's go to, we're going to start off in Genesis chapter 2. Okay. Go there with me today. See, the first thing I want you guys to understand is, first, we are one. We've talked about relationship before. We talked about how man is, in Genesis 2.18, what we're going to see here that says, God said that it's not good for man to be alone. Remember we talked about a few weeks, I know we talked about last year, about the middle of last year, where we talked about relationship beings, about how we are, it's not good for us to isolate ourselves all the time. Yes, there's times where we need to be alone with God, because you see that with Jesus Christ, where he went off by himself to where he has that one-on-one -on -one time with God. But as a relationship being, our, the same thing with us, we're not to be left alone. That's the reason why when Jesus Christ left when he told his disciples before he says he will send a helper he will send a comforter he will send someone to be with us because he does it he knew we could not be left alone because if he leaves us alone guess what will happen we'll lose our way we'll be blinded we will not know which way to go we will not understand and that's what the helper the spirit the holy spirit does for us okay so let's go to chapter Genesis chapter 2, starting with verse 18. We are going to read through 24. Okay? It states, it says, and The Lord God said, It is not good that man, Adam, should be alone. I shall make a helper for him, corresponding to him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he could call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature... That was its name. And Adam gave names to all cattle, 
to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and the sleep, and he, and he slept. And he took one of the ribs and closed and closed up the flesh in its place. And he built the rib which the Lord God had taken from man into a woman, and brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called wife Isha, because he she was taken out of husband Ish. Therefore. A man will leave his father and mother and will cling to his wife and they will be one flesh. Okay, so we see that last part. They will become one flesh, right? Now go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is Paul talking. Okay. We are going to go to verse 17. We'll start with verse 16 because he quotes this. Or do you not know that one who is joined with a prostitute is one with her body? For it will be, it will be, it is said, the two are one flesh. But the one who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Okay, so we're one, just as a husband and a wife, husband and wife, a married couple are able to become are, should be the ones that become one flesh, come one together. So therefore, we who are Christians, brothers in the Lord, brothers and sisters in the Lord, children of the Lord, should also, who are the bride of Christ, should be one with Christ. Jesus Christ prayed about this, that this would happen in John chapter 17 verses 20 through 23 where he prays that Lord let them be one as you are one as I am one with you is it not is it not a coincidence that when we read the word of God in verse 4 chapter John chapter 1 verse 14 talks about he dwelt among us and then John Jesus even said in John chapter 8 31 through 32 he who abides in my word and my words abide in him and he shall know the truth and he, the truth shall set him free abiding together is dwelling together is living as one so how do we become one with the father we study we pray. We listen. We let him, every aspect of our life, we let him dwell within it. Part of building the house is making sure that we, as human beings, first and foremost, submit, right? What is submitting? Tearing off the flesh. Killing the flesh. Letting go of the flesh. And waking and letting the spirit be awoken with the spirit of God. Okay, so when we become, when we believe in Jesus Christ, and we confess him with our heart, we believe in our heart and confess him with our mouth, and even with our actions, we become one. Okay, so when, as those who are married, I want you, you should understand this. Every single day is a new day with your spouse and every single day as a new day you learn something about your spouse whether it's good or bad true so why are you not doing that with the Lord each and every day is a day another opportunity that God grants us bless blesses us each and every day to wake up to know more about him so that we would be able to grow in him and speak him and share his love to others so that as they look upon and see the frame of the house that God built. That's the main thing. We submit ourselves to the will of God so that we build the house that God built. Not by, not by our hands, but by his hands. Because when we were building this house, by our hands, we we're building this house in the way the world wanted us to do because we put ourselves in the way. So through this, so see, as you see through this series, as you're seeing through the built of the house, building of the house, as these are the things that we, if we should be doing or are doing every single day, sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing it. 
That's the best thing about it. When you do it long enough, and you do it enough each and every day, you realize that you continue to grow in the Lord. When you, what happened? When is the incident that when you stop growing is when you say you, is when you put the lid on the jar and say, I know enough. Okay. It's the same thing with Elisha and that widow woman who had that oil. When she opened the doors, what happened? The oil stopped flowing. The same thing with us. If we put the lid on the jar, the oil can't flow inside of us. And that's the same thing as a married couple. You're going to hear some stuff from me that when I when I when I first got married to my wife, I was horrid. I lived like a lived like I was in the world. I treated her such as it was all about me and not her. Okay, and that's not how it's supposed to be. That's not how any relationship is supposed to be. When when you study the Word of God, or this relationship is not just is not about us. It's about God. It's about Jesus Christ and what he did and how much he loves us. It's not how much we can be loved and how much respect we deserve because we don't deserve anything except for a swift kick in the booty. Okay? Amen? We, only, we don't deserve... We never deserve forgiveness. That's the best thing about forgiveness. That's, we didn't deserve salvation, but that's what he gave us. We didn't deserve his love, but that's what he gives us. Because he gave of himself. And as a husband and wife, we learn that we learn this concept, the shadow concept of what Christ did for us. Go down in chapter 7. We're starting with verse 1 in 1 Corinthians. I want you to see this, okay? And concerning these, the things of which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of the temptation of immorality, let each have his own wife, and let each ha woman have her own husband. The husband must continually surrender his obligation to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. So Jesus Christ surrendered everything. Remember? That's what the cross was. He gave up everything. He and it also goes along that, that we're not supposed to deprive each other. A husband is not supposed to be deprived of his wife, and his wife is not supposed to be deprived of us. Did Jesus Christ ever deprive us of himself? How many times did he tell us, Come, come to me? How many times in the gospel do you do we hear? Come to me. We we even hear we even have a whole chapter in chapter six talk about eat of me eat my flesh, eat, I'm the bread of life. In chapter seven he talks, come unto me all who thirst, all who are weary. In Matthew you hear it talk about all who are weary. He said, come unto me, I will give you rest. He did not deprive us of himself. He gave himself and keeps giving to us daily. Of himself so that we can have this freedom in him. And when we study the word of God, we realize when we study the word of God as a husband and wife, as he is our husband, we start realizing that he more and more and more that he does not withhold anything from us. But yet, what are you withholding from him? A lot of times a relationship does not work because one side of the one side is not willing to give in to the other side, or the other side is not willing to give in to this side, or it, both sides think that the relationship is all about them and no one else. They're just trying to get something out of it for themselves. But Jesus Christ wasn't about giving it, getting something out for himself, but saving us, saving his bride, because he wanted his bride to dwell with him. And as the last we talked about last week, this, the father wanted his child to come home. Just as we are child children of God, we are also the bride of Christ. 
When we talk about unity with Christ, we talk about unity and we look at the example of marriage and how it coincides with Jesus and the shadow of Jesus and his bride. The husband and wife, when there's not unity and division in the house, look at the children. Most of the time you see it affecting the children. And when the church and Jesus Christ are not one and not speaking in unity together, and the church is not unity united in itself, whether, I want to tell you this right now, it's not about whether you are Pentecostal, Baptist, whether you go to a Methodist church or a Presbyterian church, or whether you are call yourself Messianic or not. The main thing is, do you follow Jesus Christ? Do you follow Yeshua HaMashiach? Are you part of Him? You can say all these man-made titles all you want, but the thing is, are you of Him? Those are just words. Remember what we talked about last last couple weeks? Those are just, when we talked about confession, the two parts of confession, the mouth and actions. Those are just words. You can say you're messianic. You can quote all these scriptures and all that all that, that is, but I'm going to tell you this. Satan knows the word of God too. You see this each and every day throughout the throughout everything that we going on right now then nowadays. You see this false pastor, this false preacher, and this all that, but they know the word. You wanna know how you know the how they know? Listen to them. Remember remember Satan? He knew what God said, and he twisted it. In order for you to under, know, know the word, to twist it, you must know it. Okay? Now, not, now I'm not saying that they're right. I want you to understand that. It's because there's only one way to God Father. There's only one way, and that is Jesus Christ. And he's not who we say he is. He, he is who he says he is. I want you to understand that. He is our bridegroom because he loves us so much that he gave himself for us. He did not deprive us of himself. And when he talks about unity, he does not talk about us being one with the world, but one with each other. When we start arguing about who's right and who's wrong, is that stop taking focus on the main principle that he is who he says he is and he is the only way. Then there's division inside the church. And when there's division, there's cracks. I want to ask you something. The body of Christ, each, each one of us has that principle. Part. When you look at the body, you got the pigmentism, you got the fingertips, you got the veins, you got the nervous system, you got the Everything that goes with the body that makes the body work, but when there is a crack, infection can get in. And if you don't look at the Word of God and don't have this relationship with God, Word of with God, like you are studying the Word of God as He is your husband, as you are wanting to be one with Him, as we see in verse seventeen. Right? In 617, what did it say? It said, He who is one with the Lord is one in spirit with Him. If you're not that, then there's going to be division. Because you're able to be torn apart. Are you too busy pointing fingers at other people? Or are you busy developing that relationship with God and willing to grow and have that fruit that spills out over? How else are we able to make children? If we are not one with Christ. 
How else are we not supposed to go and multiply the earth, be fruitful and multiply, if we are not one with Christ? And if the bride is not one with itself in Christ, not in the world, but in Christ, then how are we supposed to make the children? Because if there is division, there's only one set of children that are growing. That is children of the world. And we're not supposed to be making children of the world. We're supposed to be making children of the Lord. And no, we do not. You and I do not. But it's Jesus Christ working through us. Just as the ring on the finger of a husband and wife is a seal of the marriage covenant, and so is, so is taking the name, so too we take the name of the Lord and we are sealed by His Spirit and sealed by His blood. To where we proclaim his name, not our name. I don't go proclaiming that John is Lord. I go proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. What are you proclaiming? What are you studying? What are you depriving yourself from God? Remember how Jesus Christ said, don't, don't stop worrying about the speck of your brother's eyes when you got the log in your eyes. Of course, that is not exactly how it is. That's just the summary of it in a nutshell. We are supposed to love each other, right? How are we supposed to love each other? As Christ Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Go to verse 21. I'm pretty sure you, there's a lot of you who have read this. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of you who may understand this in some aspects. And there might be people who understand it in the aspects that it, we are talking about today, in the in the in the way that we're way ways being shown to us today. But if you don't open your eyes and your ears, don't open your let the Spirit of God open your eyes and your ears and your mind and your heart. How are you going to be able to take it in? What kind of ground is He planting this seed in? Okay, listen. Sorry, verse 21. Being subject to one another in reverence of Messiah. It doesn't say rever reverence of you. It doesn't say reverence of me. It says reverence of Messiah. Wives to their own husbands as to the Lord. Because a husband is head of his wife, as also the Messiah is the head of the congregation. He is Savior of the body. But as the congregation is subject to the Messiah, so also shall wives be subject to their husbands and everything. Husbands, you must continually love your wives just as the Messiah also loved the congregation and gave himself over on her behalf. So that he would sanctify his wife, the congregation, the bride, making her pure by washing with the word of Torah, teaching, in order that he would present for himself the glorious congregation, not having spot or wrinkle or any of such things, but so that his bride would be holy and without blemish. How? Because he did not deprive. How are you going to know these things? You want to know about anxiety? What the Word of God says about anxiety? Study. Ask him, pray, listen. Okay. You want to know about peace? Same thing. 
You want to know about love? Same thing. You want to know about salvation? Same thing. You want to know about redemption? Same thing. Study. As if you were looking at your spouse. What, what way am I talking about? It is the intimacy of a marriage, of a relationship. Not the intercourse, it's the intimacy. Intimacy is verbal. It's talking. We're going to be talking about this in a couple weeks, too. But we're in prayer and fasting. But one of the main things is, what did the disciples say? Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to do this. Teach us how to do that. But how are we supposed to be taught if we don't pay open our eyes and our ears and are willing to listen to what is being said? Too many times we've tried and tried, and I've caught myself doing it several times before. We try to put our own desires side of it the way we wanted to say and that's not how we're supposed to study a wife doesn't study her husband to learn what is about her and him but what he has for her and a husband doesn't study his wife but what he is going to get no, what he's going to give to her, but what he's, what she is going to give to him. I felt that for that for a long time, till I accepted the Lord into my heart, when I truly gave Him lordship over my life, where He became my King, my God, my Savior. Then He opened my eyes to a whole different way of love. Because the way we think of love is, is not love. There's only one way of love, and that is God's. Because God is love, and love is God. And the only way you're going to know love is if you know God, know Jesus. The only way we're going to know Jesus is if we study Him. Yes, there's more to this going to know someone besides study, besides reading. That's what we talked about last week. I want, that's the reason why I talked about listening first. And part of the next part about it is opening yourself up. Do not deprive him of you. and he, Because he does not deprive you of him. Whatever you ask of him, he grants it to you. All you have to do is ask. If you want to know something about him, he will tell you. All you have to do is listen. Yeah, what we say, what we say on here. Mace, we make it sound so simple, but we know it's not simple that simple. We know it's not. Because it's a struggle each and every day to understand what we need to do. Because our flesh wants to pull us away. The world wants to pull us away. But yet, we do not heed to the flesh, but we listen to the spirit. Spirit, and if we listen to the Spirit, He will direct us in which way to go and teach us how to study our bridegroom. He is our helper for a reason. Because how else are we supposed to know what the Word of God says? Because, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. You know how many people have told me that they read the Word of God but yet don't know a single thing? Those are the ones who just read the Word of God as, just, just, as if it's just words. A bunch of letters put together just to read it as a book. That's fine and dandy. Don't get me wrong. 
Maybe sometimes that's how people get saved. Because they read and something finally catches them because the spirit is drawing to them, them to this. But sometimes, but most of the times when they read, their flesh is in it. And they're too busy trying to figure out things for themselves. And trying to put themselves into the word of God. And not putting the word of God into themselves. Are we feeding God or is God feeding us? Just as a husband nurtures and cherishes his wife, so does God, so does Jesus nourish and cherish us. He gives us, us, us of himself. Does he, not, does he not feed us? Does he not give us something to drink? When we does he not clothe us with his righteousness? Does he not clothe us with himself? Part of being one is being entwined together. We read that in Ecclesiastes. Right? One stands alone is easy to be defeated, but where there is two, they can overcome. They're harder to overcome. A quarter of three is hard to break. Amen. So, my question to you, are you seeking first the kingdom of God? Are you searching your bridegroom? Matthew 6, 33 says, seek first the kingdom of God. When you go into a kingdom, what is the first thing you ask? What is one of the first thing is on your mind? Who's ruling the place and you want to learn about him? Is he good? Is he bad? Is he does he ruin with the iron fist or does he have compassion? Is he just? Hey, I got a secret for you that everybody knows. Jesus is all. He is compassion. He is just. He can. He does rule with an iron fist. I'm pretty sure many of us felt it. Well, you have stepped out of line. But you know what? He loves us still. He doesn't correct us to hurt us. He corrects us to, to help us grow together. In him. And if you're one of those who wants to have that love and to know that love of a husband, of a bridegroom, where he holds on to you and never is let go, all you do is accept him as Lord and Savior of your life. Confess him. Believe in him. As it says in Romans 10, 9. Believe in your heart and confess him with your mouth. That he is Lord. And if you're ready for that commitment. And you want to accept him as Lord and Savior of life. Just repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Be my bridegroom. I want to know you. Your ways are just, and your love is pure. And I accept you into my life. Lead me into everlasting love. In Jesus Christ's name, I do pray. Amen. If you're one of those who accepted the Lord into your heart, we we welcome you to the family. And if you are still one of those who, or one of those who walked away but came back, we welcome you back. And if you have said this prayer, email us at 
Yeshua Wellspring at gmail.com. We love to hear about it and we love to celebrate with you. Okay? So, the question still remains. And I hope you all are listening to this. Understand the reasons why we study is so that we can know who our bridegroom is. We're supposed to be one with him. Are you? Or are you too busy worried about what other people think about you? Is this just a title? Or is it real to you? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to be able to come before you today, to hear how much you love us and how much you care for us as your bride. As you do not deprive yourself from us so that we can have all the nourishment and be nourishment that we need. And you cherish us so much that you died for us so that we can live with you forever. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. Lord, I pray for those who are watching, whether it's live or down the road, or who are listening on Spotify, listening to the message. I pray that you will strengthen them and encourage them. I pray that they will grow in you and be the light in a dark place to where to those around them will come to you and accept you as Lord and Savior of their lives. And those who are hard-fought country who are facing persecution, I pray that you will strengthen them and encourage them to keep going do not give up for the reward is awaiting for them in heaven I pray for your peace in their heart your shalom in Jesus Christ's name I do pray Amen we thank you for watching us and if you want to help us in any way all we ask for you to do is to share the video Because someone out there needs to hear about Jesus. He needs to hear about the love. Go with God. God loves you. And so do I.